Maybe we should start now. So it's, uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Johan Seikens from uh, KU Leuven, who will be talking about Canon machines and dynamical systems modeling. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Boumedian, for the introduction and the, and the kind invitation. So the talk here will be about uh, kernel machines and dynamical uh, systems modeling. Um, so the talk will have two main parts. In the, in the first part, I will uh, talk about uh, function estimation and mainly from the viewpoint of uh, duality principles. So I will uh, show primal and dual model representations um, related to feature maps and kernel functions. And also uh, show how through duality principles so we can get some new unifying perspective on uh, deep learning neural networks and kernel machines. And I will also talk about uh, uh, new representations like uh, restricted kernel machines, uh, which you can also use for generative modeling. So that will be the first part of the presentation. And then in the second part, I will um, show how uh, this, this uh, framework can also be applied to uh, dynamical systems uh, modeling to different kinds of model structures either with input-output representations or, or with state space representations. So neural networks uh, are very well known and, and powerful for modeling. And you can actually establish uh, powerful maps uh, like here for self-driving cars uh, by means of neural networks uh, where we have a mapping here in this example from uh, the input space, which is the, the view on the road, uh, which is all the way mapped to the action of, of the driver. So you can map in this example, uh, like uh, yeah, 1000 uh, inputs to, to 30 outputs in this example. Uh, uh, neural networks were known to be universal approximators. And in the first wave of neural networks, this was a kind of motivation uh, to use them in a lot of different applications everywhere where you could see a nonlinear function, a nonlinear map. You can think of a neural network being there and then train the interconnection weights uh, to, uh, to solve uh, fascinating problems. So at that time, that was uh, still a science fiction self-driving cars, uh, but uh, these days uh, is becoming a more and more a reality but also the architectures have become more flexible, more powerful over the years. And like here you see an example of a convolutional neural network uh, involving uh, more than 20 million interconnection weights uh, where we have uh, fully connected layers in the end and then convolutional uh, maps, convolutional feature maps uh, in the first layers to do joint feature learning together with uh, training uh, the classifier. So over the years uh, with the convolutional neural networks, um, yeah, more and more complex architectures uh, have been proposed uh, with uh, increasing numbers of, of layers, so like in residual networks uh, these days, uh, even beyond 150 layers. So from an architectural point of view, this is uh, uh, impressive, but also towards uh, mathematics, this is also um, yeah, putting new challenges uh, because you can also see them as discretization of partial differential equations in the layer index. Um, so this uh, is also very challenging to have a better understanding there uh, about uh, underlying mathematical principles and the representations of the models. And so neural networks and deep learning it comes with uh, two revolutions, I would say uh, two important waves, uh, one in the, the late uh, 80s um, with uh, neural networks as universal approximators, but then people saw more and more the drawbacks uh, of it uh, because you have uh, many local minima solutions, even in small scale neural networks, you can have uh, millions of local minima solutions. So at uh, some point there was more and more criticism uh, related to that. And then uh, in, the, in the 90s, um, support vector machines uh, were introduced uh, with uh, convex optimization reformulation of the problems, uh, general nonlinear classification and regression uh, problems formulated uh, through convex optimization and the introduction of kernel functions. So this has also stimulated a lot of research in general uh, in a lot of different uh, fields about the kernel-based modeling. Um, and then the neural networks were striking uh, back again uh, and more challenging architectures were introduced, uh, more powerful ones uh, like uh, CNNs the uh, Boltzmann machines, stacked autoencoders, GANs, uh, and others. 
and uh, this was all possible because the computing power was also increasing in the meantime but nevertheless yeah the existence of many local minima solutions is a persistent problem so that problem is still there and also there is now more and more criticism uh, related to explainability of, uh, of deep learning models and also uh, interpretation of the models so the question is yeah how is this picture going to evolve uh, for the future so maybe one important avenue for the future is um, yeah to have a kind of best of both worlds you know, on the one hand you have the paradigm of uh, neural networks and deep learning where you have a very flexible very powerful uh, architectures they are parametric on the other hand, uh, you have a paradigm of uh, SVMs and kernel-based uh, approaches, which has uh, solid foundations in, in learning theory and optimization theory. Um, so, um, yeah, maybe some new synergies and hopefully also a unifying framework uh, is possible in the future. So that will be the perspective uh, for this talk. So, in fact, currently we have uh, ERC advanced grant project within our research team on uh, exploring duality principles uh, for future data driven modeling. And the picture that you see here, we take this as a kind of uh, starting point uh, within the project that uh, we hope in the next years we can also go beyond this. But the current picture is already quite powerful, I would say, because often you can think uh, uh, about models in terms of different representations, a primal representation, which is um, parametric and which can involve uh, simple linear models, polynomial models, but also more complicated uh, representations uh, like with neural networks and deep neural networks. You can consider finite or infinite dictionaries and through different duality principles, so like Grange duality is a simple example but there can also exist other duality principles uh, to um, represent a model in a kernel based way with uh, dual representations and then uh, work with kernel based representations in the dual. So in the simplest case in SVMs, uh, this is um, uh, related to a positive definite kernel function and Mercer kernel being related also to reproducing kernels uh, function estimation, reproducing kernel Hilbert space or or to Gaussian processes, but you can also go beyond it. And you can also go to indefinite kernels, uh, tensor kernels or, or non-symmetric kernels. So um, this picture that you see here, yeah, is, uh, is actually more broadly uh, applicable. So also towards applications, yeah, it might be interesting to see if you apply uh, your models in a particular application field, what are the typical characteristics of your application. Do you have, for example, few data in high dimensions or the other way around? A lot of data points in relatively low dimensions. And so if you have few data in high dimensions, the kernel-based models can be excellent candidates. While if you have uh, large data sets, then often if you work with uh, parametric models, this, this can be uh, uh, interesting as, as a representation. So. Uh, not only from a mathematical point of view, but also from a, an application point of view, engineering point of view, um, it can be uh, interesting to have this broader picture. Also from a statistical point of view, uh, you may integrate uh, insights both from parametric and non-parametric uh, statistics if you have um, the several representations of this model. Uh, while classically in statistics, you either work in a parametric or a or a non-parametric way, or, or if you take the, the combination of the two, the sum of the two, then it's a semi-parametric models. Uh, but um, here, if you conceive different representations in this way, uh, there is the option also to integrate more knowledge from uh, parametric and non-parametric statistics uh, in one, one single unifying uh, setting. So let us start very simple, uh, uh, just with a, example of linear regression to illustrate this and uh, just uh, assume that we have a problem here of regression supervised learning uh, input data xi corresponding uh, output data yi and we just have a, a linear parametric model here parameter vector theta to be estimated uh, consist consisting of the w vector and uh, the in intercept term b so the simplest thing that you can do is least squares, but suppose you also minimize the parameters, 
Uh, it's well known if, if you don't have a bias term here, then this is corresponding to rich regression. So you have the analytic solution to this problem and you, you can analyze the properties of this estimator. So you may say, okay, what else is there more to say about this? Well, you can also conceive this as a constraint optimization problem and write it as explicitly as a constraint optimization problem. So in this way, you write a problem that is essentially unconstrained as a constraint problem. And you make essentially the problem more complicated and you may think yeah, why making problem more complicated uh, than needed. The nice thing is that in this case, if you have here as many constraints as the number of training data, is that you can uh, also uh, write the model in a different way, in a dual representation uh, related to the Lagrange multipliers of the constraints that you see here. You introduce the residuals EI as uh, new variables uh, to the problem. You consider the Lagrangian for it. You take the conditions for optimality, and then you can write uh, the solution here in terms of the Lagrange multiplier. So you have as many Lagrange multipliers here as a number of training data, and you can find them here from solving a square linear system, the B term and the Lagrange multipliers, they follow from that uh, with a unique solution. So you see here the matrix omega is then the kernel matrix, uh, where the IJ uh, entry is uh, taking the inner product of the uh, input factors with respect to each other. So this is for a linear uh, parametric model, but you see even in that simple case, you can have uh, the two representations. So the original representation, and we call this the primal representation, for which you have a constraint optimization problem on the training data, which is also called a primal problem than in optimization theory, while the dual problem is in the problem in the Lagrangian multipliers, but we call this then also a dual representation here, which, which is then in the, in the Lagrangian multipliers uh, related to the constraints. So you see that but here in this simple case, you also have different uh, number of unknowns. So the, in the original representation, the W vector is of the same dimensionality as the dimensionality of your input space, and while the alpha vector is um, uh, in dimensionality equal to the number of uh, training data. So in the dual problem, uh, your problem is independent of the dimension of your input space. So that can already, from a practical point of view, have has already some consequences. And so here you have the choice between solving either in the primal or the dual, and both of them can be solved. So suppose you have a data matrix like this, uh, where n would be very large. Uh, to fix the ideas, a million data points or so in a 10-dimensional space, then it's not very smart to solve it in the dual because your kernel matrix would be a million times a million, while the problem in solving the problem in the primal is, is immediate. Well, on the other hand, uh, when you have a uh, few data in high dimensions, so when you have, for example, a microarray data set or so, um, well, then it's more attractive to solve this in the dual because the, the size of the kernel matrix uh, is, is small. So therefore you see, uh, you can, in fact, uh, choose the representation uh, depending on the nature of the problem that, that you have to solve uh, once you have this uh, understanding. So there is an also an elegant way to introduce nonlinearity into such models. Uh, in uh, support vector machines, uh, it was uh, proposed to, uh, to introduce then a feature map instead of X, you replace it by a feature map phi of X, uh, and you can also do that in an infinite dimensional space. And so here in the notations, I assume an Euclidean space, everything finite dimensional, but you can do the same things uh, in a Hilbert space and use then uh, inner product uh, notation here. So in the dual, you can uh, observe then that everywhere in your representations, uh, you see uh, inner products of the feature map applied to a pair of data points and you can, can replace that by a kernel function, a positive definite kernel function. So that's the way um, kernel functions are introduced uh, within the field of support vector machines. It's uh, re relying on the Mercer theorem. And from the moment that you use a positive definite kernel function, then the Mercer theorem 
guarantees the existence of a feature map so you know then that there is an existing a feature map such that this equation uh, holds so you can read this equation then in two ways either from the left to the right or from the right to the left uh, so often you choose a positive definite kernel function and you don't really care what the feature map is because in the dual you don't really need it anymore you only need to know its uh, existence However, you can also explicitly choose a feature map. For example, here in the primal representation, you may say that this model is corresponding to a neural network architecture or a deep neural network architecture. And then the feature map phi of x may correspond, for example, to a hidden layer of a neural network architecture. So then the equation that you see here by definition uh, is defining then what uh, the kernel function, the corresponding kernel function is if you explicitly uh, choose a feature map. So more than 20 years ago, uh, I've shown, for example, um, in, in a paper that you can actually also use uh, such a setting uh, to train uh, classical neural networks uh, with, uh, with a multilayer perceptron, for example, also in an SVM setting, in a kernel-based setting, just by taking the feature map phi of x equal to uh, to the hidden layer of a, of a neural network. Uh, so you can choose the, the representations then uh, in, in different ways. So the kernel-based representation is actually smart then because uh, if you choose, for example, a, a Gaussian kernel, it's a universal kernel that you have then, and you have only one single sigma value. So with one single parameter there for the kernel, you can actually uh, create uh, general nonlinear functions. Uh, so from a representation point of view, this is actually very powerful if you compare that uh, to a neural network, uh, which is also a universal approximator, but for which you need a lot of parameters uh, to, uh, to establish the nonlinear mapping. Uh, so in support vector machines, this comes with uh, yeah, a hinge loss for classification or the epsilon insensitive loss. And in the dual, you have then quadratic programming problems, uh, convex quadratic programming problems. You have sparsity in the dual, which is then related to the support vectors. And then you have a sparse solution here for your uh, alpha vector. So in our work, we have often focused on what we call the least square support vector machines. So it turns out if you just work with a simple L2 loss function, in the primal and with equality constraints uh, and that you can actually for a very wide range of problems in uh, supervised and unsupervised learning uh, in the dual you often obtain then uh, a lot of problems like kernel pca kernel versions of spectral clustering uh, kernel versions of canonical correlation analysis and so all of these very fundamental problems and also in linear algebra, of course, eigenvalue problems, generalized eigenvalue problems, solving linear systems, they are all very fundamental problems, of course. And to all of them, you can, in fact, uh, come to kernel versions of, of this in a, in a simple and straightforward way. And so you can see the primal problems also as a kind of variational principles, so for example, for kernel PCA problems. So you see here some examples um, on the slide here, examples in supervised and unsupervised learning. But the list is longer. And there are also other fundamental problems like quantum measurement, for example, which you can also conceive in such a primal uh, dual picture. Also recurrent problems, recurrent neural network problems, um, and, and many others. So if you can actually yeah, extend such a methodology to a very wide range of problems. Yeah, then you have a very clear view on representations of, of models, both in the primal and in the dual, both in a parametric and a, and a non-parametric sense. Now, that's quite uh, appealing and, and fundamental, uh, I would say. However, if you introduce an L2 loss function, you also know it's, it's simple, but you can also lose some properties, of course. Uh, typically, in the dual, you will lose the sparsity uh, property. Um, and, but in the primal, yeah, you, you, you can also achieve sparsity if you want. So in the primal dual picture, and you have different sparsity mechanisms. Uh, if you work in a parametric uh, way, then uh, sparsity in the W vector 
Uh, you create, for example, with uh, L1 regularization, like in, in Lasso, while in the dual and you create a sparse representation, a sparse kernel representation through the choice of the loss function. And like the loss function that you see here is the epsilon insensitive loss. And the fact that you have uh, zero here in the loss function around the origin is uh, causing that you have in fact in the end uh, sparse representation and so many of the alpha values that you have here will be will be zero and the non-zero alphas they are corresponding to support factors so the support factors they are in fact a subset of your training set corresponding to uh, non-zero alpha i values so another thing that you may lose is the robustness uh, property. And that can also be important, of course, when you have uh, outliers on the data. And so often you choose an, a robust loss function. And there are two ways to proceed. Either you fix the loss function and then you solve an optimization problem that corresponds to it, or, or preferably a convex optimization problem. But you can also work bottom up and start from something simple like least squares and then uh, inspect your distribution of your residuals. And if you have outliers there, you can, for example, downweight the influence of the outliers. And so you can give them a, a smaller weight, uh, VI here, to uh, outlier points and then solve the linear system again and uh, solve a weighted version of it or an iteratively reweighted version of it. So in this way, you can also implicitly uh, realize any convex or non-convex loss function through an uh, iterative uh, reweighted uh, least squares uh, scheme. So therefore, both sparsity or, or robustness, uh, you can also conceive uh, in relation to uh, LSSVMs and, and least squares through uh, uh, through iterative uh, schemes or, or afterwards modifications. So here you see a simple example of that with the LSS VMLab software. Uh, the figure at the left-hand side is just a summation of a sync function starting from noisy data. So the noise here is not uh, Gaussian and you also have uh, outliers on the data. You see with a Gaussian kernel, the estimate is already quite good. But if you do a simple reweighting here, downweight the influence of the outlier, you see in a simple way, you can get a really excellent uh, estimates. Also in this setting, it's possible to come to a prediction and a confidence uh, intervals. So within this primal dual setting of uh, SVMs, uh, LSSVMs, uh, you can have neural network interpretation then both in the primal and in the dual. Uh, so the number of uh, hidden units in the primal representation is corresponding to the dimensionality of your feature space, while in the dual, the number of hidden uh, features, uh, the number of hidden units, uh, uh, sorry, uh, equals the number of support factors in that case. And so sometimes people are asking, yeah, what is the difference between neural networks and support vector machines? So one of my favorite answers there is that uh, SVMs are more neural nets than the original neural nets because you have two neural network uh, representations. So one in the primal and one in the dual. Where in the primal you also have a parametric interpretation of the model while the, the dual is kernel based. And uh, the kernel trick, uh, which is essentially the Mercer theorem in machine learning, this is often called the kernel trick, is a kind of bridge uh, to go from, uh, from one representation to the other. So in several applications, uh, you see simple kernel functions like linear polynomial kernels, uh, Gaussian kernels, but you can also go much uh, beyond uh, this. And that's also an appealing aspect of, of uh, kernel-based approaches that you can actually um, also tailor the kernel functions to particular data types uh, and also use more advanced uh, principles. Uh, for example, based on optimal transport, uh, you can introduce, for example, Wasserstein uh, exponential kernels. You can start from graphical models if you want and uh, uh, based from uh, probabilistic uh, concepts and also come to kernel function, plug it in in, a, in an SVM, or you can work on uh, graphs, data fusion, and others. So a lot more is uh, possible there. You can go uh, beyond the basic choices, of course. 
So for many of you, yeah, this picture is uh, uh, probably uh, more familiar. Uh, so this is often uh, seen as a function estimation problem in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, uh, where in the first term here, you choose a loss function for the minimizing the training error. And then you also have uh, the flexibility of your model that, that you're controlling at, through minimizing the norm here on the function in the reproducing kernel Hilbert space. So then it's well known if you choose a convex loss function that the function f can also be represented here in the kernel based way. So this is called the representer theorem. So then it depends on the choice of the loss function, uh, whether um, you have a, a sparse representation, yes or no. So within this picture, a support vector machine is more like a particular choice of a, of a loss function. However, um, yeah, you can also um, um, see that SVMs in terms of primal dual representations have a lot more to offer than uh, just being just a simple choice of a loss function. Now that's only for positive definite uh, kernel functions. So what happens if you do not have a positive definite uh, kernel function if you don't have a reproducing uh, kernel. So there have been extensions uh, to Kran spaces instead of Hilbert spaces, uh, where you can also work with uh, indefinite uh, kernels, or also function estimation then in a reproducing kernel Kran space. So in the primal dual picture, it's actually very straightforward. Uh, uh, so you can work like, uh, like uh, this. So you have a function uh, f, let's say, you split it up into two functions. So the first one with a feature map that we call phi plus, uh, corresponding to a positive definite kernel like k plus. And then the other one with a feature map that we call here phi minus, corresponding to a positive definite kernel that we call here k minus. So we subtract then the two kernel functions from each other. So of course the kernel matrix that is corresponding to it uh, will have then a positive and a negative uh, eigenvalues. So they have positive and negative uh, eigenvalues. So in the primal here, uh, you also have here then the two regularization uh, terms that correspond to it. Uh, if you subtract the two regularization terms uh, from each other, then you have here the corresponding primal problem. So if you consider this constraint problem and just by a simple uh, Lagrange duality, if you uh, work out the expressions, then you end up with exactly the same linear system as we have seen at the beginning. So if you look for the stationary points there, it's exactly the same thing. Uh, so similar things can also be done, for example, for kernel PCA or other problems like uh, kernel spectral clustering. So it's very straightforward uh, in this way, uh, in this primal dual setting to also modify the formulations and also extend it uh, to indefinite kernels. So yet uh, another extension, uh, which is also very exciting. Uh, this is also rather recent work. Uh, the main share of the work here was done by uh, Saverio Salso, is to also consider a function estimation here in a Banach space. And so I mentioned if you would have here in the primal uh, L1 regularization, uh, you could have a sparse representation. Now you can also more generally do that also for uh, infinite dimensional feature maps. And here we consider an uh, R norm uh, on this uh, W vector where R is going to approximate an L1 regularization. You see that R is equal here to M divided by M minus one. So if we let M go to infinity here, uh, then R is, uh, is um, approaching here L1 regularization. So we have shown here that it's actually possible to have a, a finite dimensional characterization here of, this, of the solution uh, in a dual sense. And so here we describe the work in the context of Fenchel Rockefeller duality. And in this way, the dual problem is a convex optimization problem. But you see then here the kernel function is. Um, not corresponding to a kernel matrix, but here in this case, you have a kernel tensor. You, you do not have a kernel function here on a pair of data points, 
but it's a kernel function which is evaluated here on uh, multiple data points. So this is also a, a recent extension that has been made and uh, which is also related here by uh, to, to uh, function estimation in a reproducing kernel Banach spaces. So you see this uh, picture is uh, rather broad and can also be related to function estimation in uh, different kinds of uh, spaces and beyond uh, Hilbert spaces. So let us now go to some uh, more recent work. So in recent work, uh, we have also shown that through duality principles is actually also possible to create uh, unexpected new connections between uh, different kinds of uh, neural networks. In this case, for example, between a restricted Boltzmann uh, machine on the one hand and on the other hand, uh, kernel-based uh, models like kernel PCA and, uh, and LSSVM. So once you have this connection, then it's also possible then uh, to use these uh, new insights to, to create, uh, for example, generative models uh, for kernel-based representations and also a new kind of uh, deep learning architectures. So this is uh, what I'm now going to show. Uh, so here you see uh, the model of a restricted Boltzmann machine. It's called restricted because uh, in this representation in the top layer, you have uh, so-called hidden units. You don't have any hidden to hidden connections. So the, the neurons here in the top layer, they are only connected to the neurons in the bottom layer. So therefore by Hinton and colleagues, this is called uh, restricted Boltzmann machine. The bottom layer are the visible units. So they can be inputs and outputs. So they are related to what you observe in the outside the world. So like, like input to output data or something, you can see them in connection to the bottom layer. And so by the bottom layer, you observe the world, let's say, and the hidden layer is a kind of representation of the world uh, that you are observing. And often, yeah, you want to realize then some dimensionality reduction. And so often the dimensionality here uh, of the top layer is, uh, is lower than, than the one of the, of the bottom layer. So for these models, uh, you consider an energy function that you minimize, that you see here. And related to that, there is a related to a joint distribution in the visible and the hidden units, which is related to the energy function. So you need some proper normalization here uh, through the partition function. And in fact, uh, the whole power, in my opinion, uh, from, from these models uh, is in fact coming from the fact uh, that you have here in the first term an interconnection matrix W, which is kind of uh, sandwiched here between your visible units uh, V and your hidden uh, units H, which you are going uh, to to, uh, to extract. Why is that? Because this first term you can read as a kind of correlation that you want to maximize. And suppose you have uh, input data available, visible uh, information available. You can read this as looking for features H which are maximally correlated here uh, with uh, W transpose V. You can read this as maximizing a correlation between the two. However, you can also use this kind of model for, for generative modeling. And suppose you have a new feature H star that you would uh, generate afterwards with this model. You can use the same uh, term here to look for uh, an input V star, which is uh, correlated then to uh, W uh, H. Uh, so you can in fact use this simple expression in two ways. So either for training, if training data are available and you can actually look for hidden features being correlated to it, but also the other way around. If you generate a new feature, you may uh, see what kind of input data, what kind of visible information is corresponding to it. Uh, so you have the interconnection matrix W, but also it's uh, transpose by which you can go back then uh, to the input space. So this is in fact all embodied in this uh, simple term here. So for such uh, RBMs, uh, you have also deep learning extensions which have been uh, considered uh, with uh, deep Boltzmann machines. Uh, so in that case, you have the picture that you see at the right hand side. Uh, you have then the bottom layer, which are the visible units by which you are observing the outside world. 
and then you also uh, have here multiple layers of, of uh, hidden features that you're going to extract uh, just like in our brain uh, your eyes you can uh, compare with the visible units and then from there we are going to extract uh, over several uh, layers uh, hidden uh, layers here a kind of representation hierarchical representation by which we can uh, explain the data that we are observing so this is formulated here in a probabilistic setting and you have a probability distribution in the visible units and also all of uh, these uh, hidden features that you're going to extract and so this energy function for the D Boltzmann machine is also a really beautiful uh, structure uh, instead of a, a very simple sandwich in the RBM you have here a kind of deep sandwich because in the first term here in the energy function uh, you look for um, an interconnection matrix W1 and hidden features being correlated to the visibles uh, that you are observing but then in the second term uh, in the next layer you're going to look for a second set of features uh, H2 and a second interconnection matrix, which is uh, correlated then to the first set of features that you have uh, extracted. And also in a similar way for the, for the third layer. So therefore with this kind of models, uh, you can all, not only train the models, but you can also generate new data afterwards. So this is also uh, quite nice that you can do that uh, with such kind of models. Here you see a very simple example on the MNIST data on top of the training data and on bottom uh, you see newly generated uh, data by the RBM model, by the simple model. You see the data there are looking quite noisy uh, because you have simple architecture here. If you use a D Boltzmann machine then you can get higher quality uh, digits that you're generating uh, very clean digits. So they can uh, be a, a quite nice the results that you obtain with it. However, yeah, computationally, it's also quite uh, demand, demanding to uh, solve such kind of deeper models. So therefore, uh, on the one hand, we have uh, these restricted Boltzmann machines and uh, also deep versions that come with it. On the other hand, uh, in kernel-based methods, uh, we have the thing that I was uh, explaining at the beginning of the presentation, uh, LSS-VM regression classification, but also related to that in an unsupervised way, uh, kernel versions of PCA analysis. So you, you may wonder, yeah, maybe we can uh, create something in between here. Uh, this uh, is what we are going to call a restricted kernel machines because the representations that we are going to obtain, they share some uh, insights from uh, RBMs, but also from kernel-based approaches. And just like you can go from RBM to D Boltzmann machines and generative models uh, for RKMs, it will also be possible then to come to uh, deep kernel machine representations and, uh, and generative kernel-based uh, approaches. So deep restricted kernel machines yeah, was um, first introduced um, in a paper that I published a few years ago in neural computation. It's open source available. So you can, you're very welcome to read about it. So it's a new kind of representation uh, which uh, is sharing some similarities with uh, the neural network interpretations that you have for RBMs with visible and, and hidden units. And you can also try to exploit that uh, new insights uh, for these new interpretations, neural network interpretations of uh, kernel-based uh, approaches. So in that paper, this is shown for uh, LSSFM regression and classification, uh, kernel PCA, uh, matrix singular value decomposition, and Parson type of kernel-based models. And it comes with uh, uh, what I call conjugate feature duality. So in fact, you only need here um, a simple property of a quadratic form to create a new representation, uh, a new kernel-based representation of a, of a model. So I wanted to use this simpler mechanism uh, because if you work through Lagrange duality or other types of duality, uh, if, and you're going to extend to deep architecture, then uh, quickly this is going to become uh, quite complicated. So therefore here I was looking for a very simple mechanism to create a new dual representations, uh, which might be more flexible 
to understand also such principles for more complicated kind uh, of architectures. So that was actually the main motivation. I will not explain the whole theory, but I will only explain it for the problem of a kernel PCA. So the kernel PCA method uh, was introduced by Shulkov and colleagues. So they start from the kernel matrix and the size of the kernel matrix is uh, n by m. n is the number of training data. You do the eigenvalue decomposition of that and you can use uh, these eigenvectors, then these components, uh, for example, for dimensionality reduction and denoising applications. Uh, if you have here this example with this uh, nonlinear shape of the data manifold uh, with linear PCA, of course, you cannot uh, capture this uh, shape, but through nonlinear kernel functions, it's uh, possible to do uh, denoising in a, in a very uh, good way. Now, such kind of techniques, you can not only use it for dimensionality reduction, uh, but when you have data in low dimensions, you can also increase in dimensionality. So that's often forgotten. Uh, that's also a very nice property of kernel PCA. You can either apply it in high dimensions, but also in very low dimensions. And you can either re reduce in dimensionality or increase in dimensionality. Uh, if the number of uh, data is higher than the dimension of your input space, uh, you can also extract more components than the dimension of your input space. So that's also very nice. And uh, because in deep learning, all of the benchmarks are in, in high dimensions, and this is sometimes very misleading. Um, so you cannot uh, really apply a, a CNN in, uh, in very low dimensions, of course, they, they also need the high dimensions to, to illustrate it in those kind of applications. So from the perspective of our work, yeah, we still want to have methods which are generally applicable to a very wide range uh, of problems, uh, being it in low or high dimensions. So therefore, understanding these uh, representations is also very important. So we have shown in uh, 2002 that you can also, within the LSSVM setting, also obtain kernel PCA as the dual uh, problem of, a, of the training problem that you, you consider. So here you see the corresponding primal problem. It's unsupervised. And you have as many training data here as a number of uh, uh, constraints that you see here. And you only have the input data X. Xi. So the EI or the score variables, so you are looking here for directions of maximal variance. So therefore you have here a minus sign and you minimize the regularization term. So if you write down here um, the dual problem, you look for the stationary points here and you express the problem in the Lagrangian multiplier. Well, then you have in fact here the eigenvalue decomposition of the kernel matrix as the optimal solution. Uh, so an eigenvalue problem of a matrix here is nothing else but the training problem in a bigger picture. Uh, so if, uh, if you have a model-based approach here, and if you evaluate a model on the training data, well, then it's corresponding to an eigenvalue problem. If you evaluate this model here on new data, X star or so, and then you can also uh, evaluate that model or on unseen data, or you can define training validation and test sets, uh, just like in classification and regression problems. So therefore, that's also often interesting to have such a model-based approach because you can use this uh, for model selection or also for large-scale problems uh, to work with, with representative subsets and complete uh, uh, on, on the other data points uh, through out-of-sample extensions. So that's also often an advantage of a, such a model-based approach. Also, you see here what the effect is of the, of the B term, the bias term, and through the conditions for optimality, you see that it's op automatically leading to an optimal centering here of the, of the kernel matrix. So you have here the centered kernel matrix and because you have here a, a B term. Uh, so all of this just follows from uh, the conditions for optimality you prove that this is the uh, optimal solution to it. So this is the starting point. And now we are going to, starting from this uh, insight, we are going to uh, explain what is the connection with a restricted Boltzmann machine. So we do this uh, 
as follows. And here we take a, a matrix uh, notation uh, for, for the W is now a matrix instead of a vector. We have multiple components. Uh, so it's the same objective function. And we minimize the regularization term. We look for directions of maximal variance. But now we want to create a dual representation of the model. And here we do that just by uh, using a property of an uh, inequality. So here you see two vectors, uh, E and H. Uh, e are the score variables and H is a new vector uh, for a new representation that you're going to introduce. And you can uh, easily show that um, for any two vectors, uh, E and H here in this expression and this inequality holds. In the context of Fenchel duality, this is also corresponding to the fenchel young uh, inequality uh, for uh, quadratic forms. Uh, but you don't necessarily need uh, Fenchel duality for that. Uh, you can also uh, see this inequality in a simpler way. So if you use this uh, to upper bound the objective function and you look for the stationary points of that, and you can show that there is a zero duality gap and that you can also uh, come to a new representation where the H variables in the, in the new representation are actually going to correspond to something that is very similar to the hidden units in the top layer of the restricted Boltzmann machine. So how can we see that? And so here the, the first line uh, on top uh, is the original uh, formulation and the LSSVM formulation for kernel PCA. What you see in blue is the inequality that we introduced. And then we plug in the constraint uh, back into the expression. And then you see here in the first term in red, something that uh, reminds us again of the RBM representation. Uh, you see that the W matrix here, interconnection matrix, uh, is again sandwiched here between your visible uh, information, which are your input data here. You apply also a feature map to it, but you see it's sandwiched between the XIs and the hidden features uh, HI that you're looking for. So the hidden features HI here, they have the interpretation of dual variables, a bit similar like in a Lagrange duality, but uh, in, a, in a different context here. So the other terms are regularization uh, terms. You also have to make sure that your solution is bounded. Uh, in RBMs, you work with a probabilistic um, model and where you need to put a probabilistic model on your input data. If you apply it to images, for example, then you have black and white uh, pixels and then th this is corresponding to a Bernoulli distribution. So therefore you don't have these uh, additional regularization mechanisms. Uh, in contrasting kernel-based approaches, then often you want to take as few assumptions as, uh, as possible, but uh, nevertheless, you need then also regularization mechanisms. Uh, you need uh, bounded uh, evaluation functionals uh, also in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, of course. So therefore, this is explaining here why you also need these uh, additional terms. So if you consider here this uh, upper bound on your objective function J, and you look for the stationary points here, and when you eliminate the W interconnection matrix, uh, you can prove that the corresponding problem here is the eigenvalue decomposition on the kernel matrix. And the number of components that you choose here is actually this, uh, corresponding then to the number of uh, hidden units, uh, hidden features uh, of the RBM representation. So therefore we call this an RKM representation, restricted kernel machine, because it's uh, showing uh, all of these similarities with the representations of uh, RBMs. And so you also have the same uh, neural network interpretations then. And we will see later on why this is uh, interesting also to have these neural network interpretations. Uh, it's interesting, for example, for explainability of models. So also in the supervised case, and this was unsupervised kernel PCA, but also in the supervised case, problems of classification and regression, you can do similar kind of things. Uh, just use the property of an inequality to create a new representation, uh, call this conjugate feature duality. 
and have then a, a kernel-based representation also for LSSVM classifiers and regressors. So here you see a very simple interpretation and the simplest problem of uh, one-dimensional uh, linear uh, regression. So X or would be the input data, Y would be the output data. You have given observations and you would just estimate a, a straight line here. So in the original representation, you have then a WM, WMB to be estimated. In the dual representation, in the RKM representation, the HI or then the, the dual variables. So here you see the corresponding neural network interpretation, uh, similar like in a restricted Boltzmann machine, then the visible units corresponding to the input data, the output data, and also an offset, because we also have a bias term. And then the uh, hidden uh, units, in this case, it's only a single hidden unit that you, that you would have here. And so when you would have here a, uh, also a generative modeling approach, like in the RBM, then you could not only do the training of the model, uh, the HIs on the training data, that would be the training problem, but you can also have a generative modeling phase. Uh, you could think of uh, uh, generating a new feature H star and then see what kind of input data and, and output data are corresponding uh, to it. So you have a kind of model which is more powerful uh, in that sense. You can also let the model speak. Uh, you could say you could not only train it, but afterwards you can also let it generate uh, new data. So if, if the data that this uh, model is generating then are, are realistic, uh, yeah, then probably you can also have more faith, more trust in, into that model. So I think also towards machine learning applications, uh, this is uh, very interesting because you can have, it's not just a black box, then you also have uh, neural network interpretations. You know what these uh, hidden units are representing and you can also let the model speak. You can let it generate new data. So a lot of uh, interesting new things that uh, come with it. But here is just for a shallow architecture and just a single neuron and uh, in, uh, in one uh, layer of, of hidden units. So the question is then, can we also use that for, for deep learning? And just like for RBM, we create a deep uh, Boltzmann machine. So also here you can con start conceiving then uh, deep kernel machines. And uh, in the primal, this would correspond to multiple feature maps. Uh, you see here one particular example of a deep uh, RKM architectures where you would have uh, three levels, uh, two uh, levels that are unsupervised, which are kernel PCA levels. And then in the end here, um, uh, LSSVM classifier or regressor. So that part is uh, supervised. So each of them are corresponding to a feature map and a kernel function. So that it's really deep also in the kernel sense because you have uh, multiple kernel functions and each of them relate uh, to a feature map. So therefore, uh, in the paper, it's also suggested uh, because in deep learning, you have so many kinds of deep learning architectures and principles uh, to also um, yeah, make a distinction between deep in a level sense versus deep uh, in, a, in a layer sense. You can think here of in its primal form as a parameterized neural network, deep neural network, where each of the feature maps would be multi-layered and consisting of multiple layers. Um, but like a CNN, it can be that you have maybe uh, 100 layers or so, but from a kernel-based point of view, maybe it's a single feature map consisting of a huge number of, of layers, but, but it may still be shallow in a level sense. So by deep in the, in the level sense, we mean here that you have here multiple levels of uh, feature maps where each of the feature maps may be parameterized by, uh, by multiple uh, layers and, and, and corresponding to multiple kernel functions. And so it's also related then to multiple objectives uh, because the kernel PCA by itself has an objective and also a classification problem. So for the deep architectures, you have then some here of of uh, sub objectives so it's a kind of multi-objective approach uh, where the number of terms is corresponding to the number of uh, levels 
And so you have then a kind of objective function for the deep architecture uh, called here J deep, uh, which is uh, corresponding here of uh, several terms. So you see the three levels corresponding to three interconnection matrices in red, W1, W2, W3. You see they are sandwiched, uh, just like in RBM representations. Uh, you see we have here a similar kind of nice uh, structure like we had in the in the deep Boltzmann mas machine, the deep sandwich interpretation we also have here. And W1, W2, W3 are sandwiched uh, uh, between uh, uh, each of the uh, Xi, Hi of the first layer and then of the first layer and the second layer and then uh, the second layer uh, and, uh, and the last set of features. All the other terms here yeah, are related in fact uh, to regularization mechanisms. So you can use such a setting then also um, as a primal dual uh, setting for working either in the primal and uh, you, you can use on the one hand such a setting for training deep uh, parametrized uh, neural networks in their primal forms, if you explicitly choose the feature maps, phi one, phi two, and phi three, uh, if they are corresponding to hidden layers of uh, neural networks and you parameterize them in that way, you have done in the primal form, a deep uh, neural network architecture, or otherwise you may explicitly choose the kernel functions here in the dual, you can choose different kernel functions here in the different levels. And, and maybe also with different properties. I think that's also uh, towards mathematics and physics, a very nice challenge for the, the future uh, to, to think in terms of uh, invariance and symmetry properties. Uh, you may have different kernel functions with different invariance properties in, in the different levels, and then try to conceive deep uh, architectures uh, with uh, with kind of optimal properties. And just like in our brain, we have different uh, neurons in, uh, in different, uh, neuro different layers with different kinds of uh, characteristics, different functionalities. So I think this is also very challenging uh, for the future. If you have uh, any data given, can you conceive a kind of uh, mathematical setting in which you could uh, come up with the optimal architecture, what are the optimal kernel functions, what should their properties be, and what kind of invariant symmetry properties uh, do we have. So I think uh, this is an open problem for the future or use uh, insights from optimal transport or so. Um, this can be uh, quite uh, uh, interesting for, for the future. So also in deep kernel machines, yeah, there is also other work, of course. Um, some of the other work is mentioned here, like uh, deep Gaussian processes uh, have also been proposed, uh, convolutional kernel networks uh, and, uh, and others. So you can use that setting also for training uh, deep neural networks. Uh, you have also better conditioning of the pro problems than uh, also faster convergence. So I mentioned uh, the RBM, uh, you can not only train the models, but you can also generate uh, new data, uh, which is uh, stimulating. Uh, so there you have a probabilistic setting. So in the RKM, uh, we are not in a probabilistic setting, but what we have here is a kind of a super objective function. So we conceive uh, an objective function that you can use both for the training of the model and for the generation. So depending on the variables that you are fixing uh, in this function that you see here, you can use this kind of uh, objective function both for training and, uh, and generating uh, new data. And while otherwise it's the Bayes rule which is uh, ruling the game. So here is you have a kind of super objective which is uh, ruling the game. So we can also use this in the context of multi-model data with multiple data sources and multi-view learning. So I have here input data X and output data Y, like images and speech or something. And you extract the shared representation, uh, shared uh, features H. So that would be the training stage. And then afterwards uh, you can uh, generate new features H star according to the distribution here, which may be a multi 
uh, normal distribution or a mixture uh, distribution. And then you can go back to each of the input spaces uh, to generate, for example, images uh, and speech. Uh, this is also closer to the human brain. And during the day, we're observing the, the world uh, or interconnection weights in our brain or trains. And while when we are dreaming, uh, new features are generated, and then you can go back to the input spaces. It's like a dreaming phase and when you generate uh, new data. So we can also have such a generative modeling framework uh, then for the RKM representation for the kernel-based models uh, in connection to uh, kernel PCA here with application of different kernel matrices on different uh, data sources. Uh, we can use a super object objective to generate new data. I'm not going through all the details here. You can use the setting either by explicitly choosing the kernel function. So you can use it either in the dual or you can work in the primal and choose explicitly the feature maps. If you work, for example, on images, it might may be desirable to work with convolutional feature maps. So that's also what you can do here. You can work then with explicit feature maps. So you can train kind of convolutional architectures also in this uh, kernel based setting and then also go back to the input spaces. So you see some examples here for MNIST and Fashion MNIST with newly generated images, or you can uh, generate both uh, images and uh, text in your input space uh, afterwards. So you can also exploit the fact now that you have this new neural network interpretations of an RBM. Uh, it's uh, a very nice property here is uh, in the dual, uh, you have an aggregate decomposition of a kernel matrix. So you know that these components are orthogonal with respect to each other. So in the neural network interpretation, it means that all of these hidden units, uh, they are uncorrelated with respect to each other. So therefore you also have now explainability of the architecture of the kernel based model. Uh, here you see, for example, uh, faces. And if you change only one neuron here, you see, for example, the hair color changing. If you change another neuron, uh, which is corresponding to one component, then you see, for example, the gender uh, changing or the background. So we are having here a kind of uh, model uh, with a disentangled uh, representation where this property, uh, you get it for free because you have an eigenvalue decomposition of the kernel matrix. So in other approaches, so like uh, variational autoencoders, you have to impose this kind of properties uh, as, as kind of additional objective during the training. But here you get the properties uh, for free. So also towards explainable AI, uh, this is uh, quite important. So also currently uh, we are working towards uh, deep uh, RKM representations uh, where uh, or deep versions of kernel PCA where you will be able to say for every neuron in every layer, uh, hopefully uh, what the meaning is of the neuron uh, and have a kind of full explainability of the neural, the deep neural network architecture. So that's also one of the major challenges I think uh, uh, in explainable AI to uh, not only have powerful models uh, from the viewpoint of uh, the performance, but also try to get deeper insight in the representations and, and what it means uh, for the neural networks. So here we have also uh, for the generation, uh, the model is still quite simple. Here we just do simple linear interpolation in the latent space, in the feature space. Here you see an example where the four corner points uh, are just uh, reconstructions of uh, training data and all the rest that you see here of the digits uh, are generated. And you see that there is a kind of smooth deformation uh, from one digit uh, into the other, all by very simple linear interpolation in the, in the latent space and also here for, uh, for images. But also here on the 3D cars example, also, here you have very uh, nice interpretation, disentangled uh, representation learning. Here we also further studied uh, an optimization setting uh, with a manifold optimization where we restrict uh, um, the interconnection matrix uh, to belong to a Stiefel manifold. 
So it's also possible then to, uh, to do a manifold optimization for such kind of architecture. So this is also uh, further to be explored um, to, uh, to deeper kernel machines and also very promising, I think. So that brings me to the, the second main part of the presentation. So up till now, I've been talking about uh, function estimation, uh, representations of models and the role of duality principles, and also to come to, to new representations. So let us now uh, see what we can do um, uh, in the context of function estimation and what are the challenges there uh, of such primal dual uh, setting. And so from the viewpoint of engineering, uh, for example, in systems and control theory and uh, other uh, fields, uh, yeah, systems are very general. Uh, you can have uh, like cars and planes, uh, complex systems, uh, the internet communication systems, uh, traffic systems, physical systems, the universe. Um, so also in the field of uh, nonlinear system identification, um, yeah, many different architectures and uh, model structures have been proposed. Uh, black box, uh, white box in that case means you have start from uh, physical equations, physical principles. You're estimating uh, physical parameters. It's called the white box in, in that field. And black box uh, is then yeah, models for which you don't have a physical interpretation of your parameter vector. And you can conceive different uh, model structures, input, output, state, space. You can have uh, structured kind of uh, models, uh, different kinds of parametrizations work in the time domain, frequency domain. Um, so you see here some uh, references uh, like the book of Hume, uh, Schalkens or some uh, reference works uh, in that area. So within the context of, of this uh, presentation, yeah, kernel-based approaches, yeah, they have, of course, uh, been uh, abundantly applied uh, for, uh, for dynamical systems modeling. For example, also with Gaussian processes, um, uh, a lot of interesting work has been done in this direction. So the viewpoint in this presentation is more from the, the primal dual setting, primal dual formulation. So in many engineering problems, also in control problems like model predictive control, for example, Often you like to formulate a problem uh, through uh, convex optimization, for example, as a constraint optimization problem, as a specification of the problem. So also here in the first part of the presentation, um, yeah, the emphasis was on constraint optimization problems by which you uh, kind of formulate uh, the problem. So that is also very appealing if you have, for example, prior knowledge or so, you may give additional constraints uh, to, the, to the problem or you may work with additional regularization mechanisms. So such an optimization setting is actually very natural uh, to embody uh, additional uh, knowledge or to work with uh, different architectures. And also in physics, uh, also in theoretical physics, uh, if you work with different types of Lagrangians, you also sum up Lagrangians and things like that. So also in, uh, in physics, I think it's also very natural uh, to proceed uh, uh, in, in such a way. And so you choose in a particular core model, you know, like an LSSVM or, or a kernel PCA or a kernel spectral clustering for which you have a constraint optimization formulation. And then you can uh, work with um, yeah, additional mechanisms if needed, if you need more powerful models and in this way, you can prove what the optimal kernel-based representations are from the conditions for optimality and get uh, the optimal estimates. And here you see for input-output uh, representations, uh, some common uh, architectures like, like nonlinear uh, versions of ARX, of RMAX and output error models uh, with, for an input U and an output uh, Y. So you see that uh, the lagged values are used here so this is very straightforward if you work with parametrized models with parametric models because you just the classical mindset is then you uh, first define a model uh, structure like this and then you choose a function f that you you choose a particular parametrization like linear polynomial 
or neural networks, and then you just fit your model to the given data. So that's the classical mindset. Uh, but in the mindset of uh, primal dual mindset, it's a different mindset. So it's more about uh, representation and it's about much more than just fitting a model uh, at, with a loss function to, to your given data. So for SVM, LSSVM, uh, problems it's in fact more challenging uh, because it's it's not so obvious if you parameterize the functions uh, f through feature maps in the primal that you can still for example easily introduce uh, kernel functions in a dual representation so that is much, much more challenging than if you simply work in a in a, in a parametric way in, in primal forms so let us now look at some, uh, yeah, some different uh, structures. And the simplest thing is the, the nonlinear ARX structure. So then it's simple because for the training problem, it's just a static linear uh, regression problem. And for a time series prediction problem, it's a special case of it. Um, so here you see the Santa Fe laser data on left the training data and on the right hand side uh, 100 test data point in the future to be predicted and so we use a simple architecture here like this but what is often challenging with the kernel based approaches is when you have a lot of uh, data points and the size of the kernel matrix is uh, is growing with the number of training data and so when you have many data points available. Um, the question is then, can you still use the primal dual setting in an efficient way uh, to, to estimate the models uh, efficiently? So what you can do then is um, work with a finite dimensional approximation to the feature map. You start from a, a kernel function in the dual and then work, for example, with a method like uh, Nistrum approximation or random Fourier features uh, to get a finite dimensional approximation to the feature map and then use that, uh, you can use that a finite dimensional approximation to the feature map here de denoted by phi tilde in the primal. And then in this way, you get a sparse representation for free. So in the simplest case, uh, you just use a subset then at, at, uh, at random. I imagine you would have a million data points and you use an, a subset of size 1000. Well, the size of, of the approximate feature map would be 1000 in that case. And it would be related then to the eigenvalue composition of the kernel matrix of which you see here the related uh, integral equation. And so for the, for the kernel PCA, the Nistrum approximation, uh, this was uh, proposed uh, by Williams and Sager in the context of Gaussian processes. But there you only have the dual characterization. So in the primal dual picture, uh, you can uh, exploit uh, the additional knowledge to immediately use it uh, for with a feature map for a sparse representation uh, in the primal kernel-based representation. So we often work then with uh, selecting these points according to quadratic Rani entropy. So here you see an example of that. So if you do that, uh, you have a uniform uh, selection then of these uh, uh, prototype factors, um, the support factors in this case. And you see here a bar chart uh, indicating at which positions you are selecting these points. So you see they are selected here at a critical, mainly at the critical jump uh, regions uh, in the time series. And, uh, so this technique is very flexible. We have good results with it uh, for a wide range of different problems um, in, uh, in uh, regression problems for dynamical systems, but also for kernel PCA problems, uh, kernel spectral clustering problems. Also, we use these principles for large graphs and work with representative subgraphs and then complete the rest of the graph with out of sample extensions of, of kernel based models. So that's a, a systematic methodology that you can apply uh, also for model selection and scaling up kernel machines to, to very large uh, problem sizes, even on a laptop scale. Here you see another example in electricity load forecasting uh, where you can get uh, better results 
in comparison to, uh, to linear models. So semi-parametric models, uh, that's of course uh, in kernel-based approaches and, and statistics also important. So here in this uh, primal dual picture, it's also very simple here to extend. And the blue part that you see here is a, an additional linear part, a linear parametric part that you include uh, in the primal, while the non-parametric part is uh, represented here uh, through the feature map. So through Lagrange duality and application of, uh, of uh, the kernel trick, it's uh, immediate to obtain the dual uh, kernel-based representation here. So in this way, this is also interesting for modeling dynamical systems you know, where you have, a, for example, a linear trend or so, or where you have a prior knowledge uh, uh, about the system. Also, when you have, for example, a weekly nonlinear system, in the past, in system identification field, there was held uh, uh, a benchmarking uh, kind of competition known as the silver box benchmark uh, related to a physical system, which was consisting of a, a cubic nonlinearity. So close to the origin, the system behaves like linear. But if you um, excite a system uh, with a larger amplitude, uh, like you see here um, on top, then you go into uh, the stronger nonlinear region of the of the system. So therefore, in this benchmark, there was defined like a test set at the beginning here, a training set and a validation set. And you see on the test set, you have here something that is increasing in uh, in amplitude. So you go deeper and deeper into the the nonlinear region of uh, the system. So what we have seen here is that you can get better results through the partially linear. Uh, models. If you work here with the polynomial kernel function, it's also with a fixed size uh, kernel-based uh, scheme. And uh, at the right-hand side here, on top, you have, have the LSSVM, uh, the brute force uh, model, let's say. Uh, while here on bottom, you have a partially linear model uh, with the polynomial function, and you can keep the errors uh, very small here, even when you excite a nonlinear system. Uh, quite deeply into, into its uh, nonlinear region. So also in uh, applications like electricity load forecasting, we have also considered uh, additional uh, noise models. Uh, so you can also consider the original LSSVM model that you see in black, but also uh, consider additionally a noise model to it that you see here uh, in, uh, in blue that is related to correlated uh, errors. So in this case, uh, it, this noise model comes as an additional constraint to the equations. Uh, you can look at the dual representation to it. And what you see then also is that you can uh, represent uh, the kernel-based model uh, in terms of uh, an equivalent kernel function, which is kind of new kernel function then, which is uh, embodying the uh, additional properties of the additional constraints that, that you give here. Uh, in, in the primal representation. And also for model selection, uh, you may also need a more sophisticated uh, cross-validation procedures. And we also published here a paper in JMLR um, uh, about uh, how to do cross-validation for uh, correlated errors. This is also requiring uh, special attention so there are also in some application fields, um, you may also have more structured kinds of, uh, of systems, like for example, Hammerstein or Wiener systems. In a Hammerstein system, you have here an interconnection in yellow uh, between a linear dynamical system and in blue, you have here a, a static nonlinearity, um, which is, uh, uh, need to be estimated. So you have then the input output observations here for the system that are given. And you need to estimate then the yellow and the blue parts. So the, if you have a state space model for the linear system, the ABCD matrices uh, together with uh, the function uh, F. And so the question is, um, yeah, could we also use such a primal dual setting here in, in this context? to more structured kinds uh, of systems uh, to do the estimation of the linear and the nonlinear part uh, together. 
So the problem here is uh, if you do not work with a state space representation with, uh, but with an AORX structure, that uh, in the blue part, uh, you have the co coefficients of the ARX model. And in the red part here, you have the parametrization here to the feature map in the primal. But you have then the product here of the W vector and the, the beta coefficients. So when this is coming in the constraints, it's leading to nonlinear constraints. So what is also nice is that you can preserve that you have a convex optimization problem. So a technique which is applied here is, uh, is a technique of overparametrization. Uh, you, replace, you replace then beta j by multiplied with the w with the new vectors uh, wj, which appear here in a linear way in the constraints. And then you give here an, uh, an additional constraint, a collinearity constraint. So when you follow this procedure, uh, you can keep the the dual problem uh, still uh, still simple. So that is also often in a lot of applications a desirable property, if possible, uh, to keep the, the dual problem convex. But this is, of course, more challenging when you have more structured kind of uh, systems for which you need to conceive than uh, model uh, structures. Uh, but yeah, it is possible in, uh, in some circumstances. So it's also possible uh, to uh, consider recurrent uh, LSSVMs in this case. If you have an output error instead of an uh, ARX uh, architecture, then you see that in the constraints, your feature map is also depending here on the error variables. While in the static case, uh, static regression case, this is not, uh, not the case. So then your constraints are only linear in the ease. While here, when you have a, a nonlinear feature map, your constraints will depend nonlinearly on the, on the ease. So what we have shown here, if you conceive uh, such a recurrent LSSVM architecture, you can still have the dual uh, problem in the Lagrange multipliers and you can uh, introduce the kernel function. But yeah, the price that you will have to pay is you need to solve a nonlinear, uh, sorry, a, a non-convex optimization problem. Uh, in the in the Lagrange multipliers, but nevertheless you can do it, and the corresponding models, yeah, they are quite powerful. Uh, computationally, it's very demanding, but we were actually very successful in in using that for estimating here a strange attractor, a double scroll attractor of the Chua circuit. If you just start here uh, from uh, the initial condition, the whole trajectory that you see here is in fact uh, completely generated here uh, from the initial condition. Uh, but it requires solving uh, quite large scale non-convex problems, uh, which are increasing with the size of the training set. So it works well, but it's computationally uh, quite demanding. So also for estimating uh, general nonlinear state space models also, um, principles uh, of uh, kernel CCA uh, within the LSSVM setting have been used uh, related to so-called subspace algorithms. Uh, I guess you're all familiar with the Takens embedding theorem. Uh, so when you have a, a time series and you have the lagged values, if you take then uh, the number of lags equal to two times the order of the underlying system, yeah, you have the theoretical guarantee that you can reconstruct uh, the underlying attractor in the, in the state space, for example. Uh, but alter alternatively, you may explicitly work with, uh, with the state factor. So in subspace algorithms, uh, which were first developed for, for linear system uh, identification, uh, you work in two stages. So you start from the input output observations and first you're estimating the state factor sequence. And once you have the state factor sequence, then you estimate your ABCD matrices of your state space description. So the first stage is known to be equivalent to Kalman filtering. But in later on, we have also extended this to, uh, to nonlinear systems. So it's also possible for general nonlinear systems uh, to start from the input output observations to first estimate a state factor sequence. And once you have the state factor sequence, yeah, to uh, estimate the functions uh, f and g here of, this, of the state space re uh, uh, representation. 
and also for more structured uh, systems like uh, Hammerstein system, it is also possible uh, to do that. So you can do that, for example, uh, through the, the kernel CCA formulation and I've, that I've shown at the beginning of the uh, presentation uh, where I gave the overview uh, slide of uh, core models of LSSVMs. And there you have, uh, for kernel CCA problems, you have uh, two data sources here, X and Z, and then two feature maps that act on it and related kernel functions. Uh, you look here how they are correlated with respect to each other, and you also have uh, regularization terms that comes uh, with it. If you look at the Lagrange dual problem of this, then uh, it's uh, you can show that this is a generalized eigenvalue problem. And uh, these eigenvectors that you have here, well, you can uh, uh, use them to uh, estimate the state vector sequence. So in subspace algorithms, the state vector sequence is, uh, is the intersection between the fast, uh, be between, sorry, between the past and the future of your uh, time series. So you have a, a subspace with this, which is uh, spent by uh, vectors of the past of your time series and a set of vectors of the future of your time series is spanning another uh, subspace. And then you need to look at the intersection of those uh, uh, spaces. So this is also uh, related to a work of Larry Moore that was uh, uh, presented um, uh, many years uh, ago. So you can use then a uh, kernel CCA to estimate the state vector sequence. And in this way also uh, estimate nonlinear uh, state space models. So if you have state space models for nonlinear systems, um, yeah, then also stability issues are um, uh, becoming uh, quite important, of course. Uh, stability of nonlinear systems is, of course, uh, much more challenging than for linear dynamical systems. Uh, to illustrate here the logistic map, it's not because you have equations that look uh, simple, uh, like here, just a quadratic right hand side, that also your behavior is, uh, is uh, simple. So actually, uh, you see here the bifurcation diagram of this system with respect to the parameter A. And it's actually uh, quite complicated eh, with period doubling and, uh, and chaos. So suppose for such a system, you would have the knowledge that you would have a fixed point and you would need to estimate a parameter that it's very interesting to give us an additional constraint here that the parameter is in uh, belonging to the range between zero and one, for example. So also for state space models of more complicated uh, systems, uh, you may put additional constraints, for example, related to linear matrix inequalities, uh, which are characterizing uh, global asymptotic stability of your system. So for linear dynamical systems, that has been done, but also for nonlinear uh, state space representations, general nonlinear state space representations. So in the 90s, I introduced a whole theory for related to deep learning, which is called NLQ theory. Q is related to the number of layers. So deep recurrent neural networks for any number of layers where you may uh, specify global asymptotic stability or dissipativity, uh, passivity, uh, also properties related to uh, um, uh, nonlinear edge infinity control uh, with matrix inequalities uh, as additional constraints to dynamic backpropagation to to impose uh, stability of uh, nonlinear state space descriptions. So I think also for the future that uh, in some application fields that can still be important to uh, uh, put such type of uh, additional constraints. Another exciting uh, uh, application field is uh, uh, black box weather forecasting or also related to a uh, climate uh, change um, uh, other kinds of uh, challenges related to environmental uh, modeling. Uh, so at some point we were wondering uh, because we, uh, we have now uh, so many powerful techniques uh, available in, in kernel-based modeling approaches, regularization mechanisms, sparsity, um, that you may wonder, yeah, can we use this all the way 
uh, for black box uh, applications uh, also for example in weather forecasting instead of having to rely on uh, on physical modeling approaches how close can we come uh, to it or or maybe we can have new synergies in the future uh, the best of uh, both approaches so therefore we also explored uh, the applicability of a black box approaches for weather forecasting and uh, yeah we came uh, uh, yeah, quite close uh, to, uh, to, for example, forecast of uh, weather underground um, uh, through, through black box approaches, kernel-based modeling approaches. Also, you can estimate for multiple stations at the same time. Uh, here you have uh, multiple weather uh, stations. For example, uh, instead of having to estimate a function for every individual uh, station, you can use multitask learning uh, principles. So for example, with nuclear norm regularization, if you use uh, such kind of regularization mechanism, you also create uh, coupled representations, uh, coupled kernel representations in, in the dual. So that's also um, kind of techniques uh, which we have uh, explored and successfully uh, applied. Also, you may use principles of uh, multi-view learning and conceive every location as a particular view and then uh, have a combination of such kind of uh, submodels and also more sophisticated feature selection techniques uh, in space and time or transductive principles. Uh, when you have new incoming data of a new point where you need to predict to also include the new uh, incoming information, the new input data, uh, in the training stage, uh, this is leading uh, to local models, uh, transductive learning principles. We have also introduced um, moving least squares for uh, such kind of applications. So here you see the multi-view uh, model. Um, so here you have uh, as many sets of constraints in the estimation scheme for regression as the number of views that you have. So the number of locations where you have uh, information available. So for each of these uh, submodels, um, yeah, you have a regularization term that you minimize and a training error. But in red, you also see a coupling term, uh, coupling through each of the stations. Um, so then it uh, is also a question how to couple these. And here you see then the dual representation on bottom, uh, where uh, you have a sum here first over the number of training data in the representation, but also a second sum over the different views of the several substations that, that you have. So all of this uh, can be done just by simple solving of uh, linear systems, but also use the fixed size uh, approaches uh, for having sparse kernel representations. So we have here uh, real life data sets uh, available. Uh, with uh, measurements uh, from the year 2007 to 2014 here, and two test sets, uh, one uh, for a prediction in the, uh, the months November, December, and another one in the springtime, uh, April, May, and uh, compared uh, different approaches here. So we were estimating then, predicting then the minimal and the maximal uh, temperature. So here you see the results. Uh, the plots on the left hand side is uh, for the minimum temperature prediction and the, and the right hand side the maximum temperature and we compare here the results of the simple uh, LSSVM uh, with the RBF kernel versus the multi view approach and in blue you see the, the predictions from weather underground. So, so you see you can uh, often be a uh, quite competitive. Sometimes we improve over uh, weather underground, despite the fact that we have in this uh, result that you see here, we have only like uh, 10 uh, neighboring locations. So imagine you would have all the information on the world available. It's not always easily accessible, but suppose that would be accessible, uh, then I'm quite confident uh, with these approaches uh, that you can uh, uh, have yeah, really uh, excellent uh, prediction results. So uh, that can be promising, I think. Uh, also maybe in connection with uh, physical approaches, uh, physical modeling approaches and taken up, for example, an ensemble consisting of a physical model and, and a black box approach. 
in a kind of voting scheme or so, or a combined scheme. I think this can also be very promising for the future. So the hope there is that, yeah, that uh, data would be more broadly accessible and, and available uh, all over the world. And then uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, very good prediction results can, can be obtained. Also for in the context of pollution modeling, uh, here you see uh, an example of clustering time series. Uh, you see here part of uh, Europe with several measurement locations and at the right hand side some uh, typical uh, time series that, that you observe. So here we have been applying weighted forms of kernel PCA. You can see kernel versions of spectral clustering. You can see it as a, as a kind of uh, weighted form of, uh, of the kernel PCA and then also do uh, online uh, spectral clustering of, of the time series. Uh, so the, the stations in, in yellow, uh, they are similar to each other and also the ones uh, that you see here in red. So you can follow uh, online here, online estimation scheme um, for, um, for also for detecting changes uh, when there is a new cluster. Here you see two clusters of stations with similar features, but at some point when you uh, do the experiments uh, over time, you see, for example, a third cluster emerging and then disappearing again. So that's also a kind of a powerful technique that, that you can apply. So here, so here you can also exploit uh, the uh, LSSVM setting for the unsupervised learning. Uh, so we have seen the formulation for kernel PCA. The difference here is that you introduce uh, weights here. And if you choose the weights here to be equal to the inverse of the degree matrix of the graph interpretation, well, then in the dual, you also have an uh, eigenvalue decomposition problem. And the B term is, uh, is uh, taking care of the optimal centering and the MV matrix here is an additional centering matrix. So you get an automatically the right centering and you have here a, a model-based approach then and for which the training problem is an eigenvalue decomposition uh, related to a centered uh, and weighted uh, kernel matrix uh, in this way. So this is related to work of uh, random walks, uh, spectral clustering, but we have here a model-based setting with uh, primal dual representations. You can also work then with representative subsets and uh, use the kernel-based setting to scale up to very large uh, graphs and work uh, on large scale problems. So we have also used these techniques in, uh, in uh, civil engineering applications uh, with our colleagues for, of the civil engineering department, uh, Edwin Renders, and uh, using this to, uh, uh, to predict topological changes in bridges. Uh, for bridges, they have to monitor over uh, time over the years whether uh, everything is okay with the bridge. And at some point, yeah, there is, problem with a bridge and introducing some topological change there. So we have been using kernel spectral clustering to, to detect uh, topological changes over time uh, for bridges. Also for uh, complex networks, uh, if you monitor complex networks over time, uh, often it's interesting to detect some changes uh, in, in behavior of the networks. And we have also been using kernel spectral clustering within the LSSVM setting, uh, as you see here for the primal uh, formulation. So the difference now is uh, the red term that you see here, it's an additional kind of regularization mechanism where you compare your current uh, vector W uh, that you're going to estimate, uh, which in the dual is related to the components that you extract. You compare it here you, uh, with respect to the previous solution that you have. So you have a kind of uh, formulation here with the memory effect because you also compare with your uh, previous solution uh, in time. So you can actually introduce that as an additional uh, mechanism in the, in the primal dual uh, context. And this is also uh, taking care then of uh, smoothness uh, in time uh, because you don't want that the clustering result is too quickly changing over time. So you can also have some temporal smoothness of the solutions uh, over time. So as the very last part here, 
uh, of the presentation. I also show here that you can also use similar kind of uh, principles and, uh, and methodology to have approximate solutions for ODEs, uh, partial differential equations, the differential algebraic equations, and optimal solutions to optimal control problems. Uh, for example, in this case, when you have a, an ODE with uh, additional algebraic uh, constraints, there is an example given here for a time varying uh, linear dynamical system and where in front you have here a matrix set which is singular, uh, a matrix which is not full rank, which is leading implicitly to algebraic constraints. So we propose then a solution uh, X uh, to this uh, system of equations which we represent through a feature map and this is uh, appearing then in the primal formulation, the LSSVM formulation. This comes in the constraints. Uh, you see here in the primal, in the objective function, the regularization term, and then the training error that, that you're minimizing. So you're evaluating that equation then at a, a set of points, uh, end points. You also take into account here the initial condition as an additional constraint. And then from your conditions of optimality through Lagrange duality, you prove what the optimal kernel representation is. Um, so you see it's uh, involving here, not only the kernel function, but also a derivative of the kernel function. So here, this is a simple example. It was already useful for such type of systems of higher index uh, where with classical numerical approaches, you have problems, but this approach is successful with it. And we have also been uh, proposing this for uh, solving uh, partial differential equations and learning solutions to PDEs, also to ODEs, also for uh, nonlinear problems, but then in the dual, yeah, you have non-convex problems to be solved instead of linear systems, of course. And then finally, also for approximate solutions to optimal control problems, here you see a toy example. I imagine you have to swing up an inverted pendulum and keep it stabilized in the upright position. You can formulate this as an end stage optimal control problem with a control objective subject to the system dynamics in the discrete time context. In a continuous time, it's related to Pontryagin's maximum principle or true dynamic programming. And so here in discrete time, you can look at the problem in the in the co-states, so which are the Lagrange multipliers related to the, to the system dynamics. Uh, but here, what we have been doing is we have also, uh, in this case, a control signal, which is uh, represented through a kernel-based architecture, uh, which we parameterize through the feature map of the LSSVM. And then we also give the LSSVM objective uh, in the primal. And so LSSVMs are formulated in an optimization setting and also uh, end stage optimal control problems or MPC problems. So therefore you can also, it's natural to also merge them in the primal problem. And then in the dual, you can also get the uh, optimal kernel based uh, representations. So we have also been uh, characterizing this for uh, solving nonlinear optimal control problems. So that brings us uh, to the final conclusions of the, the presentation. So Boumediene uh, uh, said at the beginning, I should not feel uh, constrained by uh, the time of the, uh, of the presentation. So uh, uh, I apologize in case uh, you would feel I went over time, but uh, uh, I want uh, to conclude here uh, with saying that, uh, yeah, I tried to give a, an overview on uh, the kernel-based setting. So of course, kernel-based approaches you can conceive in, uh, in uh, various uh, settings uh, with function estimation in spaces, uh, probabilistic settings with Gaussian processes. In this presentation, the emphasis was on uh, duality principles and trying to characterize uh, through feature maps and kernels in uh, primal and dual representations. So I've also uh, illustrated that this is leading to complete uh, characterization of the, of the representations and new insights also for deep learning, uh, generative models and uh, explainability of models. Uh, it may uh, shed some new light on this. 
and that it's also challenging uh, to preserve uh, primal dual uh, picture and setting uh, for the uh, dynamical, dynamical systems uh, modeling uh, case. So I want to thank uh, many, many co-workers uh, for um, joint work over the years, uh, other people for joint work, uh, and uh, especially also the European Research Council, uh, currently also for uh, the ERC uh, Advanced Grant E-Duality for exploring duality principles uh, for future data-driven modeling. So uh, I also hope we can go beyond uh, the current uh, picture and uh, that hopefully also with uh, new synergies, also with uh, insights from other frameworks uh, to come to uh, maybe some uh, even entirely new representations or, uh, or models uh, to, uh, to have uh, some further improvement of, of methodologies yeah, that you can apply in a generic way to a wide range of uh, different application fields. So thank you very much uh, for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. That was very, very nice talk. Yes, I'm glad actually uh, I told you that there is no uh, pressure on time. So that was a very useful talk. Yeah, thank you. Any questions? Yeah, yeah someone is writing his hand. Uh, is it Fabio? Yeah. 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 Thank you very much, uh, Johan. That was uh, a lot of very interesting material. But um, I had one question. You mentioned um, multi-objective uh, fitting, and then you just took uh, the sum of the multi-objectives. But actually, have you thought about working out a Pareto frontier for doing function fitting? Well, not yet. Uh, yeah, we we are looking for optimization settings. So other recent work that we done was to consider additional orthogonality constraints uh, because uh, um, yeah, we are the example that I've shown was supervised with a supervised uh, layer at the very end. Uh, but we have also we are also looking now for completely unsupervised problems. But then it looks that. Uh, that also the orthogonality property for a single level, you have the kernel PCA in the dual, and then you get the orthogonality principles from for free from the eigenvalue decomposition. But if you have something like a, a deep kernel PCA, yeah, I, I was I had a kind of additional regularization mechanism to apply in the primal um, to keep things bounded. And I was hoping that this would automatically lead for deep architecture. Uh, that, that it would uh, automatically uh, lead to emerging properties with orthogonality properties, but clearly that's not so much the case. So we also have to impose additional um, orthogonality there, but we didn't uh, study that uh, Pareto fronts or something. That, right. oh, I think that's, that's an open problem, but it's a very good suggestion, I think. Mm. Um, but currently we are still looking at uh, efficient uh, optimization frameworks uh, because from the moment that you work on supervised it's not so obvious to to do it in the primal because it's challenging to keep the to keep it bounded mm -hmm. the reason is that i've shown in the objective function you have a minus sign uh, in front of uh, of the sum of the the e squared yeah while while otherwise in all the other terms uh, you have the sum of squares or so that you minimize. So that it's obvious that it's lower bounded by zero. But for the, the other unsupervised case, it's more challenging. Hmm. I think also a major open problem uh, towards uh, pure mathematics maybe is to, uh, to characterize also eigenvalue problems in, for deep architecture. So what, what would be a fundamental extension of an eigenvalue problem uh, for a deep architecture and for a, for the shallow case it's clear that it's an eigenvalue decomposition of a, of a kernel matrix but, mm. but what would be the kind of equivalent in a, for for a, for a deep network that's also largely a, an open problem so we are we have some we, we are doing some things uh, on that side but uh, my impression is that yeah, maybe uh, at a more fundamental level, more fundamental 
a mathematical uh, level, there might be some very interesting things to, to yeah. be there. Also in connection, yeah, to also the geometry, for example, of these problems, uh, understanding geometrical principles in connection to choices of kernel functions and things like that uh, for, for deeper forms of kernel PCA. I think this is also very challenging for the future and very rewarding mm -hmm. uh, if, uh, if that could be found, of course. Mm. All right. Uh, thank you. Other questions? Yeah, I don't see the chat. So uh... yeah, no, there are no questions on the chat. But uh... yeah, if I may. Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for this deep, deep review and the masterclass style that you don't omit any detail. A suggestion if you could write a book based on this talk, I'll be very, very happy. The question that may be a little bit off-site and not so relevant is, I heard recently about symbolic regression by somebody from MIT, Tegmark or name like that, and it was presented as paradigm shift. And the question is whether you heard of it. In that case, what do you think about it? And if not, so it's still my curiosity. Yeah, I think uh, actually we have done it already several years ago. Uh, we had a, a conference paper uh, that I co-authored with uh, Siamak Merkanun, where we, we also had uh, at the ID and, and we also had a symbolic tool uh, developed uh, uh, to specify in the, in the, in the primal uh, the, the constraint optimization problem and just to, to derive, uh, you know, what the conditions for optimality are and, uh, and uh, so to derive uh, symbolically the, the kernel representations. So actually I, I may, uh, please send me an email. I can send you the, the, the paper uh, immediately. So it was a paper, um, uh, it had symbolic in the, in the title. I don't remember exactly the precise title, but it had uh, symbolic in the title and it was uh, co-authored uh, uh, by uh, Siamak Merkanun and myself in the in the past, so we had this ID. I had this ID in the past that also to to use the that that setting. And because you see, but the question is then, yeah, for which class of problems could you really symbolically um, obtain the dual problems? So uh, when you have the, it also depends on the kind of constraints. So as long as the uh, the unknowns are linear uh, in the additional constraints. It's it's all very straightforward. But yeah, if you start having uh, no linear constraints, yeah, you start also obtaining uh, non-convex problems in the dual, or or then it's just uh, the stationary points that you characterize, uh, and you may have, for example, a duality gap. And so for some of the problems, uh, you can prove that you have strong duality with zero duality gap. And then solving the primal and the dual is equivalent to each other. But sometimes you also have a duality gap uh, between the two while you can still characterize the kernel representations in the dual. But then solving the primal and the dual problem is not necessarily equivalent. But I think this is uh, very promising. So in that sense, uh, I think uh, yeah, there is definitely a lot of interesting work uh, to be done, and we also initiated with it. But then, yeah, at some point we stopped with it. But yeah, we at least we had a tool available that that you can also use. But it's not yet as general as I would like to to have it to be. So my dream at that time would would be that yeah, you can really as a designer you could have a, on your screen, you choose a particular model, you just say, yeah, what kind of problem you have, regression or, or unsupervised learning, whether you have prior knowledge, you choose your 
structures you press the button you get your optimal kernel representation you get the training problems so a lot of things um, could could be done uh, automatically um, or it could also be an additional verification or so for more complicated problems to also have an additional symbolic check if you have uh, more complicated scenarios with more complicated dual problems and so sometimes for example for pdes uh, yeah the equations may become uh, also more complicated of course for these dual problems that they're also involving derivatives of kernel functions and things like that so also that it can be interesting i think to have uh, symbolic tools uh, so there is also several follow-up work on, uh, on what we propose there. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, also, also in the physics community, I think uh, also like in theoretical physics, um, I think, yeah, there is also um, uh, work uh, there, more advanced work uh, on uh, if you work with different types of Lagrangians and then have, have different... Uh, yeah, kind of combinations there and uh, to also get the solutions in, in symbolic ways. Uh, so I think this is also common practice in, uh, in theoretical physics. So that was also initially when, when I introduced uh, LSSVMs uh, at the very beginning. Yeah, that was also one of my main motivations to characterize uh, things uh, uh, in primal dual settings, because I think uh, also if you look into theoretical physics, uh, often very advanced uh, theories are conceived there, and it's also not so obvious to, uh, to characterize solutions, and also people there have uh, conceived and then be using uh, several advanced uh, symbolic tools to uh, to get uh, to get the solutions uh, to, to to these problems, so I've always found it <laughs> strange that that this work was not never picked up up till now. That it, uh, to to even to take this avenue to uh, to use all the insights uh, also from geometry and, and things like that, uh, also all the way to uh, to pure mathematics and. So I, I, in my opinion, at the, often in kernel-based uh, models, yeah, it's also interesting to conceive it as function estimation in reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. And it has been very effective in learning theory and in connection to statistics. But I think if you also want to explore other avenues towards physics and mathematics, I, I feel there is a lo still a very long way to go uh, to also uh, to also uh, like with respect to geometry and things like that to uh, and then, then I think such a primal dual uh, setting may may be uh, more natural sometimes. So in, in my opinion, yeah, I think it's there is still a long way to go to uh, to see all these frameworks in in synergy uh, with with respect to each other. Uh, so and, and to get uh, the best uh, out of it um, so to have a kind of a unification also in in science in uh, so uh, if, if, if you work from from an interdisciplinary spirit so i i have always believed uh, from many years ago and things that have been driving me is uh, one one day to end up with a kind of complete unification uh, from all, all uh, sciences, uh, physics, uh, statistics, uh, mathematics, engineering, and many others. So, uh, but every f in every field by itself, it's already so complicated to follow up what is going on in, in every individual field on its own. Well, if you look at the major challenges, um, yeah, you, at some point you need all the aspects should be right, uh, optimization aspects, the statistical aspects, the fundamental mathematical aspects. You need to understand the representations. So you need to have the full picture in the end and, uh, and make, make in that way, I think uh, there is still a, a long way to go, but I always believe that it, it's, it's possible. So if, uh, if more people 
uh, are open to to uh, trying to understand what is going on in a in a wide range of uh, of different fields. So, so I also want to thank uh, Boumedien uh, at this point because he. He took this uh, initiative uh, with the Fields uh, Institute uh, to uh, to launch uh, this this new avenue. And uh, you have on the one hand a lot of exciting work in uh, machine learning and AI, and then on the other hand, dynamical systems. I also been working in uh, chaotic systems uh, in the past, so also there are a lot of uh, very nice things to be done also in physics uh, so to to have all these communities to bring them all together and uh, and to see the the new synergies uh, and also in ai yeah there is a, a lot of uh, fundamental theoretical work and then also it's challenging to see how all of this is mapped to in a generic way to a to a very wide range of different uh, application fields so in conclusion, yeah, I think uh, there is hope, I think, to come to some, some uh, unified uh, understanding there. And uh, so that's my uh, hypothesis. And this is also the thing that has uh, driving me uh, over, over the years. Uh, so thanks for this uh, very nice question. Yeah. yeah, thanks again for this uh, talk and nice answers. Yeah. Any uh, other questions? Thank you. Yeah, I, I have a, a bit of a puzzle uh -huh. that is very, very intriguing. <laughs> and you mentioned mathematics and physics and the theoretical physics. And recently I heard about number theory approach to deal with this kind of difficult problems. So the question to you would be the architectures and the automated approaches that you base on primal dual, let me call it magic, do you see any hope to explain how number theory, very high level theories can, can help with very difficult problems using the tools that you are building? Yeah, I mentioned, yeah, in, the, in reply to the previous uh, question, I, will, I also uh, mentioned, yeah, in, in the past, I've also been working uh, quite a lot on uh, chaotic systems, nonlinear dynamics, stability of systems. And uh, so at some point, I was also um, yeah, doing some work uh, more related to, uh, to physics and uh, published a paper in uh, physics letters about uh, non-local in time kinetic energy. So I was uh, at, uh, at an evening, I was reading the original paper of 48 of uh, Fanman on uh, space-time uh, approach to, uh, to quantum mechanics. And uh, I was uh, shocked after reading uh, the paper because he was making a little remark in that paper about uh, kinetic energy functional uh, which I, I could never find in any textbook i checked the whole physics library and, and all the papers i was not able to to read it in any other existing paper or textbook and to me it was uh, the kind of needle that uh, that uh, was solving uh, the puzzle um, so to me it was a major major thing so I, I took that as a starting point to, to uh, think in a completely deterministic setting, classical mechanical setting, and just replace there the kinetic energy by uh, a non-local form of uh, kinetic energy. So, so in the kinetic energy, of course, you have then the, the velocity squared. So in the the non-local form, you have the product of the velocity and then the velocity evaluated at the time t plus tau and then uh, plus the velocity at t minus tau and you divide it by two. And when you plug that in, in a classical mechanical setting, and uh, yeah, it's related then to higher order Lagrangians, 
And then the equation of motion that you get then is a kind of modification to a Newton's second law of motion, where you have to replace then the acceleration by the acceleration, not at the time t, but the kind of average of what you have at t plus tau and t minus tau. And if you look then at, uh, at uh, the properties of that you, for a free particle and, uh, and a harmonic oscillator, yeah, you can also get the energy levels of a quantum mechanical uh, system through that approach. And uh, so this is, now I'm coming back to, uh, to your point. So, so that's, I'm also referring in that paper to, uh, to a lot of uh, related work uh, of higher order Lagrangians and, and non-local uh, field theory and uh, p-adic uh, kind of uh, forms. So in some of these papers, yeah, there were also connections to, uh, to, uh, to number theory. So also there, there is another interesting avenue. Also there, there is a kind of simple magic. Uh, you just replace kinetic energy by this uh, non-local in time form of kinetic energy. And it has been in recent years, uh, very successful. I invite uh, people to read all the papers of uh, uh, Rami El Nabulsi. So he has been uh, applying this to a, a very wide range of problems in, uh, in physics. Um, so, and also predicting new types of uh, superconductors. Uh, um, yeah, also modifications to, uh, to, the, to the Schrodinger uh, equation and uh, estimating this, this non-local in time uh, parameter. Um, so he really got a lot of uh, new insights and, and predictions. Uh, just starting from this very simple thing. And at some points, yeah, there are also connections there to, uh, to number theory, I think. Uh, so through this, uh, some of these uh, formulations. And this is also possible to apply in learning uh, theory. Um, so there are, you can also, and there is also in the, the workshop that uh, Boumediene uh, organized for the Fields Institute, I have some of the people working on deep learning. And they also relate uh, learning processes uh, to, to Fokker-Planck equations. So in the past, I was also introducing in the 90s, uh, the Fokker-Planck learning machine, uh, which is also, um, also in connection to information geometry. Um, using so stochastic processes uh, for learning and global optimization. So this is also used in the Bayesian uh, community, Bayesian optimization. So there you have also the connections between learning processes and, yeah, and, and their characterizations through uh, Fokker-Planck equations and, and related equations. But these are simple uh, learning processes uh, so also there was a master thesis a couple of years ago, um, uh, which I was supervising. And then one of our master students, he was, he was also studying learning processes then through this uh, form of non-local in time and kinetic energy. And because with a simple learning process, like uh, uh, steepest descent or so, you get stuck in a local optimum, but with a non-local in time kinetic energy, we have also observed that you can do tunneling uh, through this principle. Uh, so uh, it's, you can see it as a classical deterministic system, underlying deterministic system. Uh, so, so it may be that the current quantum mechanics, you can see it as a kind of descriptive formulation. Um, also, there is maybe you can see this then as a kind of underlying deterministic uh, mechanism that you can relate to it. Uh, just like today I've been talking about primal and dual representation. So maybe also in quantum mechanics, there are, uh, might exist some uh, underlying mechanistic deterministic scheme. Maybe it's not obvious because the quantum properties are so weird. Uh, to find something that is deterministic uh, underlying it. Uh, also the, the Nobel Prize winner uh, Gerard Toft has also written some papers on that uh, deterministic uh, mechanisms to quantum mechanics. Uh, 
So maybe there is also hope in this way if you conceive things in terms of different representations that, yeah, it, it may shed a, also a new light on, on these things. I also mentioned uh, quantum mechanics. I also published a paper in uh, Physical Review A uh, about quantum measurement. And this is also related to open quantum uh, systems where you also have such a primal dual characterization. So you can also derive then the Boron rule and, and quantum measurement uh, in relation to a primal problem. So the primal problem can be seen then as a variational principle to, uh, to this kind of uh, um, yeah, Boron rule in that case. So just like in classical physics, uh, in, in classical mechanics, uh, you also have uh, um, yeah, such kind of uh, variational principles, uh, which leads to uh, equations of motions in, uh, in classical mechanics. So that's also from a broader perspective, I think uh, also what I've been discussing today is more in the field of uh, machine learning, AI, and uh, function estimation, statistics, uh, approximation theory, but uh, at least from my perspective and the, the type of work that I've been doing over the years, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it, look, it doesn't look impossible to me that also towards uh, physics and, and mathematics, also some fascinating and unexpected things are, are still to be discovered there. That's my hypothesis. Sounds very promising. Yeah, so yeah. Thanks, thanks for the great question. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank uh, you so much. I'll email you, of course. Great, yeah. Looking forward to it. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah, okay. I had a few questions. I'll ask, I'll ask them to you by email because you have been around for two hours. If you need to have some. No, I went too much over time, I think. No, no, no. It's okay. Because, uh, no, no. It was really nice. I, mean, I think it's not. It's a nice talk. I mean, it's, uh, I think we need uh, this kind of talk because the, I think that's the advantage of online uh, talks is that you can, when they are recorded, then people who have to go, they can go and then they can come back to them later on. So yeah, no, so, no I'm glad actually you gave this talk. And uh, yes, but, but I asked my question by email instead of like extending yeah, this. Uh, this to it. Yeah, you're yeah. welcome to, uh, to send me emails. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks again. Thank you very much. I'll just like applaud you. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Take care, then. That's, uh, and then, yeah, take care, everyone. Take care and stay yeah. safe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Bye. You too. Thank you so much. Yeah, take care, thank everyone. So yeah, Bye. 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 -bye.